she said, um, I, it seemed like it seemed like nothing. You know, the vehicle fell. It seemed like no big deal. We were laughing or I was laughing, she said. And then I realized Iris was trapped. So I went round and there was Iris trapped by her neck. And she said, please get help. And she said she was crying. It was the first time she'd ever seen Iris cry. First time she'd ever seen her not strong was I think the words she used. Because mm -hmm. Iris was a strong girl. She was the ringleader of all her friends. That 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 piece of information of her pinned wanting help was agony for me to learn. Welcome to Crisis What Crisis, the podcast that aims to provide useful lessons for when life unravels. My guest today is the passionate environmentalist and financier Ben Goldsmith, a leading light in the rewilding movement in Britain and Europe, a former director of DEFRA, as well as a pioneer of green investment. Ben's determination to bring a focus to the crisis of our environment, especially here in Britain, is now entwined with a deep sadness. In July 2019, he lost, uh, very suddenly and tragically, his 15-year-old daughter Iris in an accident on the family farm in Somerset. Her death, of course, devastated him and his family. Paralyzed by that grief, it calls Ben to throw himself into an extraordinary search for answers to try and make sense of the tragedy, but also to find some trace of Iris. As Ben himself puts it, I've come to grasp that learning to accept something so terrible as the loss of your child is difficult without any hope of a grander scheme of some kind beyond the reaches of our comprehension. So in that search, that soul search, Ben talked to other grieving parents, leaders from a range of religions and faiths, a medium, all leading to a final astonishing moment of revelation. The result of all this is his new book, God is an Octopus, a wonderful, compelling tribute to Iris, an examination of human nature in the context of the worst kind of crisis and an explanation of the comfort he and his family found in nature itself. It is also, I think, an important book packed with humanity and that adds so much to this discussion around the crisis of grief. Ben Goldsmith, welcome. Thanks for having me here, Andy. Um, ben, this book cannot have been an easy process, um, uh, but it's, it's clear almost from the first page uh, that you fully committed to it. Uh, it's incredibly moving, raw, uh, detailed, uh, painful, I'm sure, but also as a process, not just the end result of it, but the process, therapeutic. Yeah, it was. It was cathartic. Organising my thoughts after um, that. That I guess that year of magical thinking. Um, I I didn't have in mind to write a book. Um, I think anybody who's never written a book can't quite imagine themselves doing so. Um, and then a um, friend and journalist, Isabel Oakshot, who'd written a book called Farmageddon, which I'd enjoyed a lot several years earlier, about the horrors of factory farming, um, suggested that we write a book together, a, 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 a rewilding roadmap for Britain. I was daunted by the idea, and in almost the first conversation we had after I decided to do it, she tore the idea up and said, no, 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 you, you, you need to write a book about your experience in, in, in the last year and a half since Iris died. Um, and it needs to be a personal book by you and, and, and our idea can wait for another day. Well, the right decision. Um, we, we, we've talked a lot about grief on this podcast, Ben, in different contexts. Um, losing a child, of course, is the very worst kind of grief. Um, the counselor, Julia Samuel, who you might know, uh, was on with us recently. Uh, Iris's great aunt. Oh, really? Right. Yep. Well, there we are. Um, she had uh, very strong views on the words we use in this context. Um, she feels that the word recovery itself is entirely wrong because it suggests that grief is something that happens, you know, that you recover from, that you get through, and then you return to who you are or who you were, I should say. Uh, when the truth about grief, you know, which your book demonstrates rather brilliantly, is that grief changes us. Um, there's no recovery as such is that is that is that a view that you that you agree with yeah there's the what i've found is that the is that the weight of our loss um it's, it's no less heavy than it was at the start but it's kind of smoother now you know it's kind of rounded at the edges it's um 
it's it's warmer it, in a way i've on some levels come to love the weight of our loss you know it's it's a place that i visit it's a place in which to connect with iris in a sense mm. and um so I, I i think um and and you know none of us who go through grief ask for this to happen to us you know we do anything to go back and for it not to have happened and and th these things happen to us and they do change us and they come with gifts you know you, you it's almost as if um, I was in space all this time with a space suit, suit and now I no longer have a space suit. You know, I'm exposed fully to, to kind of, to, to, to a, a much greater breadth and depth of emotion. You know, I, I feel joy perhaps more greatly than I did previously because it's so hard won. Tell us, Ben, about Iris. She was an extraordinary um, young lady. Yeah, they, they, they always say that it's, it's, um, it's the golden ones that are taken young and um, um, it was true of my older brother. I, lo I lost my oldest brother, Rupert Burley, my, my mother's oldest son, who she had at the same age that I was when, when Iris was born. We were both very young, first-time mm. parents, my mother and I. You were seven, I think, when he Yeah, when I he was died. seven, yeah. and, and he disappeared um, off a beach in West Africa. He was on a business trip, and they just found his watch and his wallet, his passport on the beach. He went for a swim, and no one really knows what happened. They never found a body. My, my mother never had a funeral to attend. There was a memorial service later and she was basically a single mother raising us I mean, she went through unbelievable suffering and and bore it with extraordinary courage and one of the first things she said to me after iris died she said it's 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 so hard for me to tell you this and it's even harder for you to understand it but but it does get better you know life and joy do return i felt angry at her for saying that to me at the time mm -hmm. i remember how, how, why you should, weren't ready to hear it. Well, why, you know, why should joy return? You know, my iris only had 15 years, you know, 15 mm. and a half years. That half is very important to me. Yes. Every day she had is important to me. But, but, but here I am at 42. I've had my fill. Why, why should I have joy and life again when, when she's been deprived of hers? That was my feeling at the time. I didn't want it to return. Mm. And, and one of the helpful things that, that um, Kathleen O'Hara, who was a grief counselor I saw in those early months, had said to me is, when you do feel those moments of sunshine through the bleakness you know, even if it's just enjoying a cup of tea or um or, or, or finding a joke funny you must grab it with both hands you know you, you deserve it and it's crucial to your survival to grab those moments of joy when they do start to return um and allow yourself to because often you feel guilty even if there's no reason to feel guilty you feel guilty that you're still alive yes um our iris was a star she was a golden child you know from the start she was um you know wise and smart beyond her years you know she always had the most brilliant little comeback she was a strong feisty little girl you know the, the, the ringleader among her siblings and her friends in in every possible circumstance every time you know the the, the, the life and the energy just shone out of her. You know, she had very bright blue eyes and, and, and autumnal coloration, my mother used to say. She mm. was the kind of color of kind of auburn and autumn. And um, she was like a little sort of fairy when she was little. Um, yeah, you're, right, you're right that there's a sort of, there was a, a, an otherworldliness about her. Yeah, I, and, I, and, and, and maybe that's what parents feel when they've lost a child. Maybe mm. they immediately attribute kind of, um, sort of mystical qualities to the child that they've lost but but you know I, I remember at the time you know when she was little just from the start being extraordinarily proud of that girl you know she was just she was one to show off you know you put her at the table and she could hold her own with the adults and she was amusing and witty and and she um, was determined I mean uh, um, there's a conversation that you refer to in the and clear-sighted it seemed because there's a conversation that you refer to in the, in, in the book where you as parents do, as, as we have that moment with our kids where we have to raise the subject of, of drugs. And she said to you, don't worry, let me tell you the difference between me and the others. There's never a moment when I don't have one eye on the future. Remarkable thing. To yeah, remarkable and, 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 and agonizing to recall, really, because she, um, I mean, she was so sparkling in her preparation for her future. You know, it's, in a sense, I derived comfort later from the notion that even though she didn't live her future in actuality, she lived it in, in preparing for it and in, in anticipating it. But, but she was incredibly organized and, and um, um, she was organized and determined is the word you use, determined child. I mean, we, we found um, on a little table in her bedroom, some mind maps, I think they call them, 
where she'd mapped out her future, you know, what universities she might go to, and the American ones on one side of the graph and the British ones on the other side of the graph, and, and, and what she should do to advance in English literature, books she should read, plays she should see, you know, how she should, um, you know, how she should uh, uh, look after herself physically, exercise, she learn how to play tennis, um, these kinds of things. And, and, and they were quite staggering. Mm. And it, it was sort of inconceivable to me in, in the pain of finding those things that a child that had made such an effort to prepare for her future ultimately didn't have one. Ben, can we go to July the 8th, 2019, the day of the accident? Um, you saw Iris briefly the night before uh, when she came to the when she came to the house in Somerset. Yeah, she was meant to come the evening of Monday the eighth with a friend. It was the very start of the summer holidays, and I'd taken that week off to spend a week in July with 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 them, and um, and we had some cricket matches planned. Um, I play cricket with my nephews. My my two teenage sons play. A handful of friends. We have a team that plays friendlies against local leagues and other teams, and we had a game on the Monday. And the idea was we'd all be together for dinner on Monday evening. Sunday evening, the cricketers had arrived, my nephews, and we had one of my brother-in-law, Imran Khan's uh, nephews from Pakistan over, Shisha, a talented all-rounder. And um, I got a call quite late at like nine o'clock saying, from, from Kate, saying, oh, I Iris and her friend Rafi are on the train now. They're coming a day early. I remember feeling a slight pang of irritation, you know, kind of logistically speaking, and it was not going to be anyone at the house really the next day. Um, I wasn't going to be there. How was I going to sort out collecting her from from the station and so on? And um, so I, I I managed to get a cab and they arrived really quite late. I mean ten ten fifteen or something. And um, it was the briefest of encounters. You know, I, it's the last time I saw her. You know, I remember clocking that she'd suddenly become taller than my niece Tyrion, Imran's daughter. I put them back to back, and um, we had a little giggle. She hadn't recognised Shisha in the darkness. She she thought he was her cousin Suleiman and so she'd hugged this guy she'd never met before um, and then giggled in my ear that she'd hugged him because she hadn't quite realised that it wasn't Suleiman um, her cousin and uh, and then they kind of sloped off down the lawn to the kind of outbuilding which is where we have some bedrooms and a, a, a sort of party room where they kind of hang out where they were going to sleep and I, I regret not going with them you know I, I think ordinarily I would have gone and hung out there for a bit but on this occasion we had an early start and went to bed and that was the last time I saw her and the next day we woke up. I woke up the various boys in the house, my wife Jemima, and we, we had a quick breakfast, which I made, and we piled into two cars and drove to Gillingham Station to get on the train to go to Charterhouse, where the team we were playing had managed to rent the pitch there. It was what, what, one of the a team of Indians f over from India, and one of them had gone to Charterhouse. Right. So they got hold of the pitch, and my wife Jemima was taking the same train on to London, where she's a chef in a restaurant. Mm -hmm. And um, so the only people at the house were the two sleeping girls, Iris and her friend Rafi, um, our two toddlers, Jemima and I had two toddlers, Eliza and Arlo at the time were kind of two and less than one, mm -hmm. and, um, and an au pair we had for the, a German au pair we had for the summer. Mm -hmm. um, and then later in the day, my ex-wife Kate, who lived in a cottage nearby, went round to see Iris and Rafi for a cup of tea before going to London herself. Right. And um, she told me that Iris had Iris had said to her, um, you know, I saw a ghost in the night, mum. You know, she said, I, you, know, you know, I've never said stuff like that before. I don't know, but I saw a ghost last night in our room. And didn't I, Rafi? I woke you up. And Rafi said, yes, yeah, you woke me up. I saw a girl my age in the room. I honestly saw a ghost, mum. That was the conversation they had. And then, um, and then Kate hopped in the car and herself drove to London mid-morning. And the girls heard from Rafi later they hung about in the garden playing music from a little music machine and they played some tennis which Iris had been learning at school um, and then they um, and then they had some lunch with the little children and then they hopped on a farm vehicle known as the mule which is a, a kind of Polaris sort of quite a heavy slow moving thing it's really yeah. used to lug it's stuff around it's been described as a quad bike but it's not a quad bike it's, not quad, it's much bigger it's a, six, yeah, it's a yeah. six seater it's like a van it's like an open sided van with a with a with a truck bed at the back that mm. you can put stuff in you can move hay around you can you can round up cows with it I mean, it's not particularly quick it's a big kind of diesel thing and the children have been driving it since they were seven or eight you know i taught them how to drive it supervised and and then and then i i in their sort of teens i guess 13 14 i'd allowed them to start driving it themselves mm -hmm. and um actually quite a slow moving thing 
Yeah, it was not very yeah. quick. Yeah, it was not very quick. I mean, you. I don't. I don't think this particular one was licensed to go on the road. Mm. You know, I think you could have got a, a number plate for it, but it, it was a slow moving thing. It's a farm vehicle, much slower than a quad bike, mm. um, but but top heavy. And as it turns out, they turn over. They can turn over. It hadn't really occurred to anyone that this could turn over, mm. but that they they can, and it did. She they hopped on it, and they'd intended uh, Iris and Raffi just to drive down the lane and across a field which has a track running diagonal to the bottom corner of the farm where at the bottom there's a, a road and on the other side of the road is the dreamers farm where the four dreamers children had grown up and they were on the like they were sort of like yeah. almost siblings with 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 my children they'd all grown up together a gang of seven children and monica oakley the oldest of the girls was iris's best friend and iris went to get her at the end of school and to introduce her to her new friend from from her her her, 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 her new school and so they hopped into this vehicle and drove down the lane and instead of following the track down the diagonal of the farm they weren't even wearing shoes you know they, they she they just should have been a three minute four minute journey and they'd have been back with the third girl iris decided to go off the track and snake it left and right to to scare her friend you know as fast as it would go um and i guess it would have been lighter than than than, than ordinarily just two girls in it rather than more people and things and tools and mm -hmm. it was always carrying stuff and i guess the ground was incredibly dry at that time and um she lost control of it and it fell uh, meanwhile we were playing cricket in charter house and we 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 we, we, we were batting second we bowled well and 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 um had a little lunch in this kind of marquee this little marquee by the side of the pitch and um, our opening batsman had been out almost straight away. And I was with my son, Frankie. We were both batting lower down. And we decided to go for a walk around the boundary of the cricket field. And um, we, we, we went for this little wander, the two of us. We, we, stopped to look, we stopped to look in the church at the edge of the cricket field. Charter House has this chapel. And the big oak doors were shut. But I remember us trying to kind of open those doors to have a look inside the chapel. And then we made our way on. And as we reached the far point at the other side of the field, I saw my ex-wife Kate's um, uh, boyfriend Paul who with whom she now has a baby mm -hmm. um, and who plays in my cricket team come running round the edge of the field and he arrived ashen faced and he said it's Kate it's Kate this Iris has had an accident and he handed the phone to me and I said you know Jesus what you know what you know what's she done now I said she's she's turned the mule over Ben she's not breathing and I felt that it, it, a sense of electricity run through my body that you get when you receive really frightening news I, cold you know cold through my limbs mm. and um i said um she said the ambulance is there um and i said i'm coming so i hung up gave the pool back the phone back to paul and i frankie and paul went one way and i ran the other way and I went to get my phone that was charging in a little booth next to this marquee, pulled my phone out. My hands were shaking. I couldn't quite get it switched on. And I called, started calling people at the house and no one was picking up at the house. And um, we have a gardener called Nick who's there all the time. We have a neighbor called Astrid who was there all the time. I, I called everyone I could. And then I called Kate again and they, she, she, she was driving back from London. She said that, they haven't got her breathing there's a the helicopter ambulance there there's the, 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 there's people there i'm going you need to come you need to come and i went around the back of this marquee where there was a building site and there was a little workman's shed and i stumbled into the workman's shed and there were two guys in there having a cup of tea and i sank to my knees and i said my daughter's had an accident i think she's gonna die god help me god help me and i fell on the floor and they didn't know what to do they sort of froze and one of them brought me a glass of water drink this drink this and I think I was just moaning or groaning and praying on the floor. And into the room came my friend Ben Elliott, who said, you need to pull yourself together for 30 seconds to get to the car. To the car yeah. And so he picked me up and I leant on him and we walked to the car in my cricket whites with my studs, him and his. And I said to the boys, everything's all right. Iris has been an accident. We're going to go to Yeovil Hospital. At this point, I presumed they'll get a breathing again that's what you do you get people breathing again people survive these things we've all seen it in tv that's mm -hmm. especially young vigorous people you know young strong 15 year old girl she was not fragile iris you know she yeah. was a strong you know charismatically and physically she was a strong girl and um that's what i clung to so i got in the car 
And I said, I'll see you at Yeovil Hospital. They, I saw them getting into Paul's car, and I saw the cricketers milling about. The game at this point had stopped. And then in the car we drove, and no one picked up, and no one picked up. And I called and you're, called. You're, you're in touch with Kate? And then I called Kate. And the calls to you both have stopped. Exactly. And, I, and Kate said, you know why they're not answering, don't you? It's because she's dead. And I said, don't say it. Please don't say it. And all I could think of that poor girl driving on her own on the mm. motorway. No one to drive her. And I couldn't bear it. I wish I could have been in her car. I wish someone could have been driving her. Yes. And I remember sending a message into a WhatsApp group that we have for people that are at Canwood saying, Kate is going to arrive before me. I don't know what's happening, but make sure someone's there, please, to hold Kate. And as it happened, we arrived at... So we arrived at roughly the same time. So so I I pulled into the lane first and with Ben Elliott, and then the car behind was Kate on her own. And by this point, there was a few people milling about on one side of the lane at an opening to a field on the right. And an opening to a field on the left, there was an ambulance parked, a couple of paramedics and two policemen. And down the slope was this the, the, the wheels of this vehicle pointing back up mm. on the grass towards us. And the policeman said, are you Ben Goldsman? I said, yes, do, do you know what's happened here today? I said, I think I do. And he, at this point, Kate jo joined me and I held her arm. And he said, I'm afraid your daughter Iris has been killed in an accident here. Would you like to see her? It was all very matter of fact. Even in that moment, I remember thinking, these people are such professionals. They're able to deal with the worst possible situation in such yes. a matter of fact, calm way. You know, you'd imagine he'd be crying too, or he'd hold you, or, but of course that's not their job. They have to deal with this in a professional way. And yes. the paramedic said to us, first words he said was I must warn you she's in a body bag and they slid the side of the ambulance open and we went up two little steps and there was this beautiful girl in a body bag zipped halfway up so I remember her beautiful profile and she had such a lovely profile and um, and I saw her shoulders and there was no seemingly any injury at all there's a tiny fleck of blood beneath one of her nostrils nothing else as it happened, they'd worked on her incredibly hard and done all kinds of things to try and save her and try to access her lungs through her rib cage and all kinds of things. Um, I think at one stage I was told a lot later they'd got a heartbeat, but, but only for a moment. And I was told by the paramedics in that same conversation, maybe four months later, that if they had saved her, she'd have been significantly brain damaged. Um, and it, it, it would have been an unlikely occurrence in any, in any event. And Kate started saying, my baby, my baby, and said to the paramedic, please try again, please, and pleading with him, can you please try again? And at this moment, we heard another car come in, and it was the boys. And so we got out the side of the ambulance in time to shut the door. Yes. And I said to the boys that that Iris is dead. And Frankie, who's the nearest in age to her, made a, a kind of guttural noise, and then we sort of held each other, the four of us, for a moment. And then Kate was remarkably strong. You know, she sort of got the boys by both hands and walked off towards the house. And I hovered for a bit and then followed them. And um, we, we got back to the scene of the house where people were starting to arrive back already. My nephews were there within five minutes. The police car glided down the lane and, and, and the policeman got out and asked me to get into his police car to complete a statement he'd written a statement very basic facts I'm the father I've arrived on the scene this is what's happened mm. and it was all very very businesslike I, I wanted to kind of scream I wanted him to you know I wanted to beg him to do something to help to make you know is this really happening you know I kept saying to him mm. and he was very calm we filled the complete the, the form signed it and then off he went and then Kate's mother arrived. By this point, I lose track of time, but Kate's mother arrived and took her off to the hospital to see Iris in the hospital. And I was in just the days yes. there in that yard, sitting on a chair in that yard as people milled about and arrived and, le and left and so on. Ben, the first thing I, I, I'd, like, I'd like to say, having heard you know, that um, account, is just how sorry I am. You know, and, and I think anyone who's listening to this, watching this, will, will want me to say, to say that to you and it's uh, 
and the way that you've described it there, you know, is is is, is so um, is so unbelievably moving. Um, the the practicalities point that you make there, the kind of the professionalism that you encounter, first of all, from the police and, and others. Uh, Julia actually talked about the importance of how you know you 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 learn of 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 your loss, the words that are used in those conversations, and obviously they're trained professionals that to, to not try and sugarcoat it, actually to try and get to the practical things that need to be done, as hard as that is. But you're then, of course, thrown into a, a very long process of wretched practicalities. You know, the you know there's the formal identification, the talking to the police, as you say, obviously later the funeral and inquest, obviously because of the the accident and obviously because of who you are some media interest as well um, do you remember at all how you managed all that because although you write in great detail about how you you didn't cope you talk about your grief and the physical effect it had on you and we'll get to that but you were managing it how, how, how did you um, how did you manage that so I, I have a big and close family. You know, my, my nephews and my niece didn't leave my side for the next two months. You know, they stayed in that house. Kate and the two teenage boys were there you know, in the cottage nearby. We, we began to call it the grief kibbutz. You know, we, we, we were in that place in Somerset eating together three times a day, you know, 15, 20 of us for, for two months. It was thankfully start of July, so the summer was a good time to do that and I think my friends must have coordinated some kind of rota because it seemed without any planning on my part I always had one of my best friends you know, next to me mm. you know doing nothing in particular you know we, we we fell into a routine you know we 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 would play cricket on the tennis court you know we would bowl a plastic cricket ball and play four side cricket and we sort of I went through the motions and we played these games of cricket that were distracting and mm cups of tea throughout the day and I allowed myself one drink in the evening and not more more than one had the wrong effect I'm too emotional I couldn't cope mm. but one well, I started drinking Japanese whiskey someone brought me a bottle of Japanese whiskey and still to this day I allow myself you know, not every night but when I want it I have a single Japanese whiskey with ice you know it, taking small pleasures through the day but I, I don't remember a great deal about those early weeks and I I remember the process of dealing with Iris's death from a practical perspective being incredibly easy but that's partly because other members of my family took responsibility you know, my sister Jemima and others dealt with the funeral you know I all I said was I want an Ave Maria and I someone suggested a poem I should read which was I carry you in my heart by E.E. E. Cummins which I read in the funeral mm. it, unbelievably I don't know how I did it um, I didn't have that much involvement in the admin side of things. The inquest is something that's done away from you. And the inquest happened so long afterwards that it felt like they were talking about someone else's family. Yes. I felt removed from all of that. Mm. After sitting in that police car, I was not that involved in the process. Mm. Um, I think the most painful things were learning about the details of, of, of how she died in, in, in conversations I had. The seeming, seemingly a throwaway comment would leave me reeling, you know, yes. reeling. You know, the, the, the friend Rafi said to me a while later, in the first time I saw her after the accident, poor girl must, must have been terribly traumatizing for her. And, f and thank God she was not hurt. Um, she said, um, I, it, seemed like, it seemed like nothing. You know, the vehicle fell. It seemed like no big deal. We were laughing or I was laughing, she said. And then I realized Iris was trapped. So I went round and there was Iris trapped by her neck. And she said, please get help. And she said she was crying. It was the first time she'd ever seen Iris cry. The first time she'd ever seen her not strong. Well, I think the words she used. Because mm -hmm. Iris was a strong girl. She was the ringleader of all her friends. That, that, that piece of information of her pinned, wanting help, was agony for me to learn. Um, you know, I agonized over the details of, you know, could Nick, our gardener who'd heard the screams, could he have got there quicker? You know, could, 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 could he have lifted it? He couldn't lift it. It was too heavy. Could the two of them have tried to lift it? You know, 
I wanted to find that vehicle in that scrapyard, wherever it ended up, and see if I could lift it, see if I could lift it with one friend. I agonized over the details, the what ifs, as if by agonizing over them, you could somehow unpick the past that maybe it didn't have to be real. Yes. And that's, I think, an instinct that we all have, or certainly that I have, is I want to fix problems. I'm good at fixing. I've always been the problem fixer in my family, in my wider family. You know, I'm quite good at solving problems. People bring me problems, I fix them. And this is one that I couldn't fix, but my mind couldn't let go of the idea that perhaps I could. And so it whirred around and around and around the details of what might have been, what might not have been. And in the end, I just exhausted myself with that. And someone once said to me that my friend George Frost, who lost his older, his older brother Miles, who my very close friend Miles, who just dropped out of a heart attack, because of a congenital issue in his heart. He's a David Frost. David son. Frost's sons. And Miles was you know, one of my closest friends in the world, as is George. And Miles was just dropped dead on a jog, age 31. And George was the one that found him. And he said, the greatest curse becomes a blessing. And that's that you can't do anything about it. And there's a truth in that, because initially the fact that there's nothing you can do about it makes you want to rip your hair out. Yes. But eventually that, that you can do nothing about it becomes something of a blessing. Yes, yes. And that group of people that you described includes, you've mentioned him already because he was there on, at the cricket match, Kate's partner, Paul. He himself, of course, is also yeah, I th deep experience of, of, of grief, lost his parents in the, in the, in the tsunami. I often, I often, I, I often thanked God that Kate had Paul because he knew deep grief. You know, as a teenager, had lost his parents in, yeah, in, the, in the tsunami in Sri Lanka and had under, and, and as just a solid and, and wise person and kind, and ordinary person, not complicated. And he, he, um, he was the most extraordinary and, and still is the most extraordinary support to Kate yeah. and the arrival of their little boy, Arthur, you know, two years after Iris's death has been the, a ray of sunshine in, 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 for all of us, yes. particularly for those two. Yes. Ben, let's, let's talk about the, the, the home, uh, because it's the picture that you've painted there is, you know, is one of the support, but you are at the scene of the accident. You're looking at that place uh, every day. Was there a point where you felt, I don't want to be here, actually, I can't stay here? And, and, and obviously that's not where, it, that's not where it, it, it ended. You, it became a great source of comfort to you, I think, to be there, but a difficult process, one imagined. Yeah, it, I think in, in the first week or 10 days, I don't think I thought anything of the future just blackness yeah. you know and I, I i i didn't even think of you know how we survive i didn't know if we would i just tried to live minute by minute you know i i wandered around in a state of um yeah a, a, a state of fear really it, it feels very fearful the whole thing feels very fearful yeah. grief you feel like you're afraid, but you don't quite know of what, or like there's a, feels like you're waiting, a lot of waiting, even though you don't know quite what you're waiting for. Like, like, like waves, I mean, Kathleen O'Hara, who was a grief counselor I saw, described them as waves in the ocean. These waves of emotion come over you and you find yourself in floods of tears around a corner or on the floor, you know, like in the depths of despair, but you do feel a little better afterwards. And then you have a short period of time where you're sort of able to function and then it comes again. And as time passes, those waves become less frequent, you know, mm. less regular. Um, I, I think I think after the funeral, which was, I forget, maybe a week or 10 days after the accident, I arrived straight back at Canwood that evening. And I went from the car on my own down to the pond where I swim. There's a little stream, which is the headwater of the River Froome that, that runs through our farm. And as it rounds a bend, we've we've widened it and opened it into a kind of swimming area with a little island, and it's 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 a very blissful place to swim. And I stripped down and dived into that pond, and I remember very vividly being struck by the beauty of nature in that moment. It was it was the last of the late afternoon sun. You know, the place was humming with life that time in early July dragonflies everywhere and, and swallows all above in the sky and there's the island has a tree on it and the sun was shining kind of laterally through the leaves of that tree and it looked particularly verdant and green and the water felt kind of warm N not not just in in physical sense I 
it felt in a kind of metaphorical sense warm I felt enveloped or held in some way and I remember thinking that that I'm amazed that I still find the world beautiful I could not imagine that I would find anything beautiful or joyful ever again and here I am in this pond swimming on my own on the day of my daughter's funeral you know inconsolable but appreciative of the beauty around me you know and I um I, I realized then that that um, there is something I guess perhaps to live for and it's here and 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 my survival may even depend upon staying here yes I, I remember it very clearly that moment um, but it was one of astonishment that, that I still found beauty in the world yeah Ben you're a man with very strong views on rewilding the decline of migratory birds beavers uh, protection of the flyaways that see those birds kind of coming here and the wetlands that they need you have strong views about sheep that you're also uh, making public at the <laughs> as, as we speak it's a it's a it's an important um, part of your life and as clearly as you've touched on there been a very important part of your grieving process the two yeah. things have become I mean, I, won a, I, I wrote a letter at the age of 14 to the Country Life magazine, Britain's biggest um, rural magazine, suggesting that their readership lack imagination when it comes to the subject of wild boar. So the wild boars are native species in Britain, a, a keystone species. They're nature's gardener. You know, they, they turn the soil in the way that no other animal can. And that bare soil becomes a germination bed for about a third of the plants that grow in Britain. Trees like ba black poplar and European aspen willow sallow they need the activities of wild boar to germinate wildflowers that, that, that are abundant in europe things like poppies and cornflowers and scarlet pimpernel they, they need the activities of pigs um, they're, they're important keystone species and they're extinct in this country for the last 300 years and i won the prize letter for that you know we're talking 1995 or something yes, yes. so I, I i've been obsessed since i was a child with the idea of restoring wilder nature to britain you know, we're one of the most tamed um, landscapes or countries in, in, in Europe. We're one of the most nature depleted countries on earth in fact. If, if nature is wealth then the United Kingdom and Ireland are near the bottom, you know, in the bottom three to five percent of countries of the world. So I've devoted more and more of my time and my life to this movement and um, since Iris died I've, I've sort of cut my, my life has kind of coalesced around this mission. You know, this is what I want to spend my life doing. Um, as much as I possibly can. Ben, one of the great uh, rewilders uh, is your friend Anders Paulsen. Um, he and his wife Anna lost three of their four children in a terrorist attack in Sri Lanka, which again, people listening and watching, um, listening to this podcast and, and watching will remember um, something that happened just three months before you lost Iris. Um, you travelled to their home in Scotland and spent time with Anders as, as part of the process that you embarked on to try and make sense of what had happened. Uh, an important conversation, one imagines. Yeah, I, mean, I remember being absolutely floored by that news. I mean, it's inconceivable, isn't it? What, what the, yes. scale of, the scale of the devastation that they suffered. Easter 2019, for weeks I couldn't think of anything else. And... Um, and then July that year, I lost Iris, and um, Anders, like me, is 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 and and are passionate nature lovers and have embarked upon this extraordinary multi generational mission to restore nature and 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 vibrancy to a great swathe of Scotland's Highlands. They bought these vast deer estates, mostly from foreign owners, and they have reduced deer numbers. and The Caledonian forest is starting to reemerge in 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 a way that is quite mind-blowing to see you know you you know you travel from Inverness airport through that landscape and you arrive at Glenfeshie it's like moving from black and white into technicolor you know landscapes that people said couldn't have trees couldn't have wildflowers or birdsong landscapes that we we've been told all our lives are are natural in a, in a bare and barren state are reawakening and there's little trees dotting the hillsides right to the very top Th there's no doubt that he derives a meaning for his life and uh, in in the wake of that tragedy in 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 nature recovery in restoring nature spending time in nature you know, it's his mission on this earth and he's doing things all over the place now with increasing vigor at increasing scale 
not just in Scotland, but in Africa and in Romania. You know, I hope this year to travel to Romania to go hiking in the Carpathian Mountains in an area that was saved by Anders from industrial logging, you know, a place where you find bears and wolves and a place that the Prince of Wales, oh, sorry, the king now <laughs> loves to go and has even built his own guest house because of the richness of, of its nature. The king's been known to say that if, if you want to see a, 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 a medieval English landscape, you know, go to um, Transylvania, Carpathia. Um, these are wild forests with, with, with beautiful flower-rich valleys that are cultivated by by, by these villages. And um, so Anders, Anders is like me, completely devoted to all of this stuff. And I think without it, he'd have found it found it a lot harder to survive what he has survived. Yes, yes. You, you speak to Anders. You speak to a number of other uh, uh, parents who've lost their who've lost their children. You seek those people out. You are on a a mission to understand, to try and make sense, um, and you you embark on this other kind of process of self examination, Ben, of of faith, of of these sort of deeper questions that until you lost your daughter, that you hadn't, like most of us, spent too much time um, thinking about too deeply, and that was sparked by a meeting with a spiritualist. Yeah. So the, these kinds of ideas and questions had never meant anything to me previously. Now, I was not a religious person. I'm christened and confirmed, but that's because I got a week off school for getting confirmed at, at Eton, and my mother got me christened with my sister when I was younger. You know, I, I, um, I considered that there's enough here in this world, in this realm, that we don't need to think about anything anything else is a distraction you know nature is magic the complexities and miracles of nature the the un innumerable interactions that take place between different species before your eyes the patterns when you go walking up these things have always fascinated me since my earliest memories i uh, i didn't need more you know i didn't I, I i felt that invisible gods and spirits in the sky were just um, a, a, an excuse to get on with pillaging what we have here because it makes what we have here somehow humdrum. Mm. Um, I, I felt in some ways that the religions of the world have been complicit in the destruction of nature in some in, in some senses and um, didn't interest me at all. And um, in, in the early days after and weeks after Iris died, you know, people did write to me referencing on ongoing existence and you know, you, you, your connection with her remains intact and Iris still loves you wherever she is and, you know, and, and, and she was chosen to, to be taken at this time and all these kinds of different ways of looking at it. And mm. They didn't really resonate with me. Um, you know, I, I, I was more focused on just trying to survive one day after the next. And, um, but I, what I did find incredibly helpful was seeing other bereaved parents. So I went to see a handful of mothers and fathers who'd lost teenage children, some of them friends, some of them friends of friends some cases they'd lost their teenage children 20 years earlier mm. just to talk with them about how they survived does life really return just to get a sense of you know, i have a duty to survive this i have younger children i have a young wife you know who's married me and will spend the rest of her life with me i've got people who need me and so this, I, this is dr driven by a sort of practical i can't, it, it was very practical I, this right? was a practical requirement i can't check out of life at yes. this stage Yes. You know, I can't just check out. I have to find a way to live again. I have to laugh again. I have to find joy again. Because for me to check out it will inflict an, an enormous degree of loss and pain on, on, on those who rely on me, particularly my, my other children and my wife Jemima. And I, I wanted to see how it's done. And I wanted to just, I derived solace from being with these people. They were helpful. They knew, you know, the, those people who've lost a child are in a kind of invisible club. And, and 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 when we talk to each other, we we are on the same level. We kind of know. But you 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 were you were clearly before um, you lost Iris, a uh, fundamentally curious individual. Yeah. But that seemed that accelerated. Yeah. Uh, so I I I had never been particularly curious about theology, religion, spirituality. No. It felt hocus pocus to me. Yeah. But um, other issues. I remember clearly. seeing. I remember. Yeah, about other issues. Of yes, course, I read yes. a lot, and and um and, and and I'm interested in culture and interested in history, and interested in the culture of theology. And I've always been fascinated by the, the rituals themselves. It's something beautiful to see, kind of whirling dervishes of the Mevlavi, you know, or the you know, or the the beauty of Tibetan Buddhism. I've always found these things incredibly beautiful from an aesthetic point of view, mm. and I've recognised their importance from a societal point of view. But I just wasn't religious or spiritual. I just didn't buy it. And then one of the mothers who lost a child as a teenager, 
many years before, at the end of our conversation, handed me a number and a name and suggested I go and see a spiritual medium in Fulham and, um, and that I, it might offer me something. Because I'd asked her the question, do you think your son is still, uh, his existence is ongoing? This is the hardest thing to stomach, is the idea that their existence is no more, that they've just vanished. Mm. That is the hardest thing, because it's so unfair that some people should live till 96, and that, 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 that your golden child has had their experience extinguished in, in its entirety at the age of 15 and a half. Now, that is the hardest thing to stomach. So I grabbed a bit of paper and thought, well, of course, if of course I'll go. You know, maybe there's something here. Who knows? I've always been a skeptic. And I went to see this lady that very afternoon in, in, uh, in Fulham and sat in her front room. And um, I don't seek to persuade anyone that, that, that what occurred was real or was, you know, the, the, the Iris was present in the room. F for me in that moment, it was extraordinarily real. You know, we, we had a conversation for an hour and a half in, in, in which um, this lady performed some kind of magic. You know, I, I don't know how she did it. You know, she, either she reads my mind or, 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 or she had some indefinable line of communication to Iris. But I had a conversation that was extremely meaningful in which Iris described the accident, how she kept apologizing. She kept apologizing for this having happened and you know, how she'd always taken risks and gone too far. But if it was going to be at any time, it was going to be at this time that she had to leave and that, and that, and that she felt like she was waking up from a dream and it had taken her some time to figure out where she is. And, 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 and she delved into things that are unique to my relationship with Iris. You know, th things about how I made her breakfast and things about how I always begged her to play tennis and she'd finally learned and she wished she'd been her chance to show me and she was going to show me. And, and um, she never took a wrong turn. Now, what that event did was on one level, it gave me an extraordinary degree of comfort mm. in the sense that, wow, maybe there is something to this. Maybe the religions of the world, when they talk about an afterlife, you know, an ongoing existence, maybe they're onto something. You know, who am I to say that 99.9% .9 of all the humans who've ever existed, what they believed is false? Who am I? You know, maybe they were right. Maybe she is still there in some alternate realm of some sort. You know, maybe we are able to communicate. And in, in the madness of that early grief, it was an extraordinarily comforting thing. It, it, I can't quite describe the joy and the tears of my time after that. I mean, the hours after that, I walked the streets and sat in a cafe and bumped into a cousin of mine. And I could barely articulate to her what had just happened. And, and I cried and it was just so meaningful. But what it more importantly did was it got me exploring. You know, what, you know, a small proportion of humanity believes this is hocus pocus, including until recently me. You know, what is out there? What, you know, what, what is our experience after death? It, you know, do we have a soul? Is there a part of us which is, you know, n not our conscious mind? I was aware of meditation, for example. You know, had been aware of meditation as a tool for calming us down and helping us to live. You know better happier lives and I was aware of the basic idea that our personality is kind of divided into the kind of conscious ego which helps us to survive and thrive in the world and a deeper kind of spirit or a deeper kind of consciousness which is where we feel such instincts as love and guilt and you know, a sense of responsibility and the kind of better aspect of ourselves perhaps and by silencing the first you give greater expression to the latter and, mm -hmm. and I was aware of these ideas and maybe it maybe this 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 part of us somehow survives death maybe iris is still there in some way so i i i, I um i met those religious leaders that i knew the vicar in somerset i was introduced by a friend to a rabbi who i still see occasionally in in north london fascinating man with tremendous kindness and tremendous wisdom and i've learned a lot from him and i went on 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 on, on a couple of occasions i see a buddhist monk at the vihari in acton um a friend who is a car mechanic local, local to where I first lived took me to see his his Buddhist monk and and what was interesting to me is that they they sort of talk in very similar language you know they they talk about souls surviving death and in some instances they talk about souls returning in a kind of cycle in to re-experience earthly existence more than once you know reincarnation and so on and 
all of these ideas were deeply appealing to me, you know, in the hope that maybe Iris comes back, you know, maybe we have another baby, maybe, you know, you think, you think along those lines. You know, where did I end up? Um, or where am I now? Um, I don't think these things are easily explained. You know, I, I'm, I remain skeptical of those who believe they know the answers to any of these questions. Yes. I, I, I believe that we are part of a grander mystery than meets the eye. And I believe that um, it's incomprehensible to us sitting where we are here in this world. Um, I think there is far more magic. Um, and I think that the, the reality is far stranger than, 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 than we might imagine, perhaps that we're even capable of imagining. Um, and I, I, I believe that I have an ongoing connection with Iris in a way that is difficult to articulate. Yes. Um, you know, I, 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 I posted a message on my private personal Instagram to Iris. I took to writing little letters to Iris with a picture of her that only my friends could see. I found it very cathartic and on her 19th birthday. And, and what I said in that message is that I, is that my grief and my pain is, is, um, is infused with a strange sense that somehow she's close by even though I can't see her. Yes. You know, I feel her closeness and I, I, I feel an ongoing connection in the form of the love which I feel for her, which is the same as it always was. You know, if I allow the thoughts to clear, the thoughts of disappointment and sadness and rage that she's lost from this world, this, the, this, the sense of loss for her future that she won't live, the the, 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 the missing of her, the, the what could have been, all those thoughts, if I allow them to fade for a moment and just dwell upon the love that I have for Iris and the love that that she had for me then I feel a very powerful connection that feels other that feels otherworldly it feels powerful and it feels two-sided and it's rare but when I feel it it's overwhelming and it feels to me that there's an ongoing connection which is love you know, I feel that if there is a frequency into whatever realm Iris is in, whatever that might mean, mm. the frequency is love. You know, and I think that is, um, and 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 uh, I don't think it matters what shape that takes or whether it's two sided to the extent that she is a conscious existing being in that realm. I'm absolutely open minded to the idea that she is, but time itself may be an illusion. The whole thing is stranger than we can possibly fathom. So I don't know what any of it means. I just know that I have this ongoing connection in the form of the love we feel for each other. And I can go to that place almost when I want to. And it's deeply meaningful to me. It's wonderful. Um, ben, was there any resistance to your... Because on, on one level, you know, we, the detail with which you go into this in the book, it's fascinating. But is, you could also look at it and say it's kind of borderline obsession that you kind of fell into on this exploration that you that you embarked on was there any resistance to it from from anyone were you steered away from it or was it encouraged because i was just me going about I, i've always been obsessional you know i'm obsessional about beavers you know i believe beavers are the most important tool we have for restoring life to our landscapes i think they're the keystone of all keystone species the top of the pyramid and i'll tell anyone who listens and you know, members of my family will joke about my obsession with return, returning beavers to you know, every river system from which they've been extirpated. I've always been obsessional all my life. But I, I, I certainly on this stuff may have felt a twinge of self-consciousness and certainly would not have rammed any of this down anyone's throat, especially given that I'm not evangelical. I don't know the answers. No, no. So it wasn't as if I arrived at a place of saying that the, the, you know, the Orthodox Christians have got it right or the Kabbalist Jews have exactly. got it right and therefore I'm going to proselytize on their behalf. I never got there. Yeah. So, so, but w w what, I, what I w would say to those who are bereaved or hurting is absolutely don't be closed-minded to the idea that there's a lot more than meets the eye to reality and that death may very well not be what we think it is. Ben, can I bring the conversation back to something in this realm? That's <laughs> yes. <laughs> that's, you touched on it. But um, social media. Yeah. Right? You're a prolific tweeter. You've engaged with social media pretty actively. Um, before and, and after Iris's death. There's often a, a view, obviously, it comes up on this podcast frequently, you know, is social media a good or bad thing in crisis? You found it to be a good thing, yes? 
Yeah, I mean, I was lucky in that there was kind of, so I've always been sort of interested in politics without ever wanting to be in politics. And Iris died in July 2019. And perhaps that summer, that autumn were among the most interesting in British politics for a very long time. You know, with, with the chaos around Brexit and will it happen, won't it happen? And the new leader of the Conservative Party and the election of December 2019. And, you know, I found that a helpful distraction, undoubtedly, because I didn't have the attention span in the early months to absorb myself in a book a really you know aside from the kinds of books i was reading on kind of religion and spirituality which was a specific line of inquiry i couldn't watch movies i didn't listen to music i was fidgety the whole time it's very difficult and the bite-sized pieces of information on something completely unrelated to your life was what i needed and i mm. found scrolling twitter you know at that time very very helpful um, I now limit limit my participation in Twitter in a time sense you know, to about 20 minutes a day yeah. because otherwise you can spend the whole time you know, following one link through to the next and reading endless articles and it's a rabbit warren. But at that time it was very helpful to me. But not just in terms of receive but also in terms of transmit. So my, tr my tr transmit, I, I've done that on the things I care about since I first discovered Twitter and I probably am a little bit unrestrained on that my private instagram is comprised of people who are my friends and my family yeah and not not people i don't know yes and on that i wrote a little note to iris with a picture that was meaningful to me roughly every two months for the first year and on the birthdays since yes and writing those messages those letters to iris about how i was feeling and ab about how much i miss her and about my meanderings and wonderings as to where she might be now was enormously cathartic yes and it also made me feel supported by those that i love in my life by the replies that came back yes so it was definitely helpful to yes. me yes um, it may not be for everyone i've always been quite an open book i i tend not to hold back i tend to be quite open in talking about how i feel about things yeah so it, it it didn't frighten me to do that yes and i found it an unblemished positive i think i'm right in saying that it's it's one of those posts i don't know whether it was on the on on instagram or or, or elsewhere that led to you getting a, a, a i think a, a letter from someone who'd read one of your posts to say look um maybe you should try this yeah this being a fairly extreme hallucinogenic uh, tea hallucinogenic i mean bear in mind okay I have, i've always been a ritual yeah so i've always been very square about such things i've never been one that can handle um drugs very well you know i'm sort of hyperactive and high energy and you know on the occasion where i've tried drugs when i was much younger it, it never really worked for me i'm not moralistic about it um i just it just wasn't very me i like to drink if i go out you know i've, I've certainly smoked marijuana i think prohibition of marijuana is absurd you know i recognize the dangers of marijuana for those who are too young or those who do it too much or those who take kind of chemically enhanced versions of it but fundamentally marijuana for me is on a par with wine or whiskey you know you can abuse those as well so that's sort of the only things i've ever really engaged in in, in terms of shifting my consciousness you know mm. alcohol and marijuana but a number of people said to me people i respect and some quite unexpected people sorry people i respect and some quite unexpected people yes. suggested that I completely alter my consciousness for a period of time by drinking this hallucinogenic tea that comes from the Amazon basin, which is a central part of kind of the spiritual lives of millions of people across the Amazon basin. So it is to them what the red wine of the of the Holy Communion is to Catholics. That's what they, they do at moments of individual and collective tribulation. It's what their spiritual leaders do to obtain, obtain enlightenment and so on. And, you know, the, uh, the early Europeans who arrived in South America and, and imbibed this tea reported experiencing spiritual revelations and um, feelings of deep connection with all other living beings. And of course, the Catholic Church quickly prohibited all Europeans from engaging in this. And so I did some reading on this and realized that you're hard pressed to find an indigenous society, past or present, anywhere in the world that doesn't engage in these kinds of practices as kind of a central tenet of their spiritual lives and so i read up on it and i thought well if iris is out there this is how i'll find out so it was absolutely part of my quite practical and rather obsessive quest to figure out whether there is some kind of life after death you know and and um so i i, I did a lot of research and i found someone that i 
took faith in and um, had several conversations with that person and took references and you know I was quite scared I mean really it took a lot of courage to do this I mean to do it anyway is quite frightening I think mm. you know to, to embark it's quite full on right? yeah I mean, to embark it's, it's on something a... that's going to floor you for an entire night yes with the possibility of vomiting thrown in and send you to a place the likes of which you've never known you know, if you, all you've ever been is too drunk or a little bit too stoned off smoking a joint then this is a really different league mm. and to do so when you're less than a year since losing your daughter and have been in a state of deep grief and emotional vulnerability it, took, it it really did take courage you know i mean really had to steel myself to do this and i had sweaty palms and adrenaline just thinking about it for days and weeks beforehand you know for, for me it was a watershed moment in my grief i did it over two nights and it um it's it's difficult to articulate in words the depth of the experience and i've attempted to do that in my book um, and I, I won't necessarily do so here, except to say that it's like a kind of lucid dreaming. You know, it's like it's like being in one of your night dreams, but in a far more vivid and vibrant way, a far more translatable way in which you have more autonomy to decide what happens next. Mm. And you um, hold on to it. And you hold on to it. And it's difficult to emerge from such an experience without imagining that there are not some kind of alternate realms of existence. Mm. Mm. You, know, you, you, you do feel waves of kind of knowing or I mean, the waves of knowing that I had were of understanding those religious people I've known in my life as to why they did what they did. You know, I had an elderly nanny called Mimi who went to church on a Sunday with her best hat on. You know, my brother-in-law, Imran Khan, who's devoutly Muslim, who, 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 who is absolutely rigid and, and rock solid in his faith that there is a God and that, that God has you know it, it is, is comprised of love and that god has great intentions and great benevolence and that that he is doing right by god you know when i think of the kind of other religious people i've known my uncle teddy who was sort of religious in his fervor for nature mm. i sort of found myself sort of muttering you know muttering to myself they knew how did i not know that there is more out there that there is a god mm. now i don't know what that god is or what shape you know what what it means i think the mystery is far beyond our understanding and i think the religions have done their best to try to to, to try to interpret this but i believe that we see the tip of the iceberg and i believe that we are enveloped in a kind of benevolence of some kind and i felt it when i swam in the pond that day and i felt confirmation of it when i was in that strange lucid dreaming of this ayahuasca tea i did it over two nights and i saw my iris not in a in a in a in a in a sense that she was there in an apparition in a sense that i saw with perfect clarity my relationship with her i saw cleared of all the muck of the thoughts and the anger and the grief and the i just saw my perfect little relationship with my little girl you know who i had known so well the little looks we shared with each other at the table to someone said something funny that without realizing it the 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 the, the, the little moments that we share with those that we love that aren't necessarily describable in words but we know each other so well i saw that crystal clear and then the others in my life my other children my wife my mother my siblings my nephews my niece i i saw them with a clarity that i'd never seen before i i know them better than i knew them before but most of all i left with a sense of awe like i emerged from this thing that i don't ever intend on doing again because it is very frightening and it is extraordinary and very kind of um yeah it's it, it's an undertaking that i don't know that i would do again or mm -hmm. that i need to but i left it with a sense of awe for you know the blessings i have in my life and for this thing that we're part of and that i'm alive at this moment and um yeah it was a watershed i think you know i uh, in, the, in the midst of the process, you asked for a pen and paper. Yeah, I, I, write, I, and you I, I scribbled. I scribbled in in kind of barely legible letters on on a piece of paper, and I drew lots of hearts and people's names. And this was as we were emerging. And by the way, there's a euphoria in having survived it. And you mm. come out the other side. There's no danger, of course, that you're not going to survive it. This is non. It can't kill you. This stuff, you know, it doesn't. You're going to be fine. That's you know. But 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 it's not enough. You still emerge from it think thank god that's over mm. and my god i'm not going to let what i've experienced be be unpicked by my own logical mind later i will hold on to this you know like the ratty and the mole when they see the you know when they see the god pan the friend and helper in that beautiful chapter in wind in the willows and there's a kind of forgetting but they hold on to it you know the experience that they've had mm. and i decided to write it down it was sort of illeg illegible 
But I'd, I found a bit of paper later that day and I'd written, God is an octopus. And I remember there being something octopus-like about whatever w it was that was enveloping me. Yes. Like the flame of a gas cooker that was sort of in all things and all living things. It was sort of pluralistic to infinity. And, uh, and, uh, and uh, so I wrote those words. I didn't remember writing them. And that's, as a joke, I said we should call the book that. And Bloomsbury, the publisher, decided to keep it. So the book is called God is an Octopus. <laughs> Superb. Um, ben, you've, ex you've, you've explained um, uh, ju just, just how all of these things that we've discussed have kind of weaved into an even greater purpose for you now in life. Um, but you've also created the Iris Prize um, with Kate uh, in, in, in memory of your daughter. Tell us about it, please, and why it's so important. Yeah, I mean, y young people have the greatest to fear from environmental breakdown. You know, the effects of the degradation of our natural environment are beginning to be felt in such a way that the future looks a little scary. And young people have the fearlessness and the energy, as well as the knowledge now, to be the ones who do most about this. It's sort of unfair that they should be the generation that, that is going to do the heavy lifting, but it is what it is. And so I thought that we could help lift up young people from around the world who are doing wonderful things, the things that Iris was not able to do. And especially those from um, communities that are harder to reach, those from indigenous communities, for example, or inner city communities, you know, and, and, and provide them with funding and provide them with mentorship. The Iris Prize is our kind of, um, our way of honoring Iris's life and helping other young people. Who That's are a wonderful legacy. Um, but, but Ben, the book is a wonderful legacy. You know, there are, um, we, the team and I had this exchange um, uh, that there are books that sort of stay with you uh, and, your, and yours is a book that stays with you so um, thank you I'd like to finish though by asking for your crisis comforts three things can't be another person that help you through have helped you through um, three specific kind of comforts what would they be so when, when we saw each other first this morning you said Oh, you're, you're a cold water swimmer. Well, my, my little secret is I don't really like swimming in cold water in the winter. But that pond of mine in Somerset from about April through till October really is a source of refuge. And it's not just that pond. Anywhere I go, I love to swim in wild water, in the sea, swimming in the sea. And we all love it. But swimming in rivers, ponds, I, I find that somehow cleanses me of kind of emotional overload. You know, if I'm feeling particularly anxious or upset if I dive into the sea dive into the pond um, and swim um, just splash about in the water I come out feeling better every time it yeah. really works so that for me would be high up the list and if I were braver I'd do it throughout the year I just can't face jumping into a pond that feels like a slush puppy in January but but I have friends and family members who derive even greater comfort when the water's colder yes and I won't diminish um, their recommendation um, the second would be just walking in nature. You know, I think we need this every day. If I, if I don't spend a little bit of time in nature, even if it's literally to eat a sandwich on a park bench in a square in central London, if I don't see the birds and feel the sun on my face and look up at the trees just for a few moments each day, I start to feel short of something. I start to feel anxious. Mm. And, and if I'm really s feeling low, you know, I will switch off my phone if I'm able to, I'll grab the dog or even better, persuade my wife to join me and I'll walk on Hampstead Heath or walk through Regent's Park or if we're in Somerset, which more often than not we are, just go walking in nature yes. and, and using all five senses to kind of observe nature, to kind of, it's, it's a sort of meditation. I'm very bad at meditation. I just, I'm just not very good at it yet. But, but walking and s noticing the smells and the sounds and identifying stuff, oh, that's a blue tit and I can hear a chiff chaff singing. It, it clears your mind and makes you feel better. Um, I think I think the third is um, I think the third is playing with children. I mean, I think you know, I, I've got a little boy called Vinny. He sounds like a Hatton Garden uh, watch dealer, <laughs> Vinny Goldsmith, or a villain. Um, and he's six months and just rolling around on the floor with 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 children and playing games and you know just losing yourself in 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 play with children, your own or someone else's. I think is enormously cathartic. Yes. You know, I think they kind of somehow surf the sort of quantum froth when they play and yes. they're sort of yeah. of this world and not of this world. And I think that's why they play. And I think we can participate in that and benefit from that. And of course, they benefit from it. Yeah. Um, 
most importantly, putting my phone away, not not being distracted by. I, th I think I think messages and obligations. I think when you're not feeling up to it, can really knock you down. Yes, you have to be in the right frame of mind to deal with obligations that come relentlessly into your yes. phone. Very good, Ben. Thanks so much for joining us. It's been a pleasure. If you've enjoyed this episode, please do give us a rating and a review. It really helps. And if you hit subscribe wherever you download your podcast from, you'll find loads more useful crisis conversations. You can follow us on Instagram and TikTok, and you can watch the full episodes on YouTube. Just search for Crisis What Crisis Podcast. You can also find full transcripts of this and every episode on our website, crisiswhatcrisis.com. Thanks again for joining us. <laughs>